verses 1 through 6. That's 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe in the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Hello, church. I'm glad you're here. Uh, Joey just told me that um, over $3,000 was collected above and beyond our goal day. And so congratulations, church. You know, that's, that's a job well done. Not only did we pay the mortgage off, but we've started a new building fund. And so we just rolled that over until what we do next. And that'll be very expensive, and we'll need a, a large sum of money for that. So we'll have to build that up over time. Uh, to come up with that. And, and you probably heard that the Manchester Church in Manchester, Connecticut built a building and it cost them $3.2 billion. Million. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we got to get ready, right? And so if we build out, grow this building, it was gonna, it's going to be a very expensive endeavor. And so uh, keep that in mind. So, but job well done. We've got $3,000 set aside for the next project and we'll let that grow every month. Um, about 20 people are at the youth rally, so if you see some holes in the auditorium, we got about 20 of our young people, Donnie and, and uh, Rose, are with our young people at the youth rally, so a bunch of our folks are away. I know many people are sick, hopefully some are listening online. Um, I heard about a couple, they were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, and it was nighttime and they crawled into bed, and uh, the lights were off, and were off, and all of a sudden, the wife said, Walter, do you know what you did 50 years ago this night? And he said, no. He said, you gave me a hug. And he says, all right. So he kind of half-heartedly reached over and gave his wife a hug. And then there was a few more silence. And after a few more moments, she said, Walter, do you know what you did 50 years ago? He said, no. He said, you gave me a kiss. And he says, oh, okay. And so he just kind of half-heartedly reached over and gave her a peck on the cheek. And went down and laid back down. And then he was about to sleep when he heard, Walter, do you know what you did 50 years ago on our anniversary? And he says, no, what? She said, you nibbled on my ear. And all of a sudden, the old gentleman pulled through the blankets back and was stumbling around in the bedroom at night in the dark. And, and she says, Walter, where, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to get my teeth. <laughs> that's, a, that's a terrible way to begin a sermon. Uh, um, marriage is full of ups and downs. And... And as I look at scripture, there's not many good role models. Have you noticed that? That as I look at marriage in scripture, that the, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, sadness. There's a lot of difficulty. But that's what life is about, right? It's a, it's a lot of ups and downs. And many of us did the traditional vows whenever we got married. And part of those traditional vows, you have that phrase for better or for worse for richer or for poorer. You know what? We had no idea what we were saying when we said that. Especially the worst part. You know, and, and things get, do get worse. They do get worse, right? Those of us have been married for a while, we understand that. There's been challenges, there's been ups and downs, and so what do you do when things get worse? Well, for some couples, they look for joy someplace else. 
They look for pleasure someplace else. Some even look for sex someplace else. And so when things get worse, rather than working, and it's not a time to throw up your hands and give up. But that's why I've entitled this lesson, Cultivating Commitment. That's whenever you, you dig really deep and you, and you work on your marriage. And so I've been focusing on couples, and today I want to talk about Abraham and Sarah. Uh, they were a couple, and they were a married couple, and, and, and as I look at their life, I see a lot of confusion, I see foolishness, I see excitement, I see great promises, I see all of that. As I look at Abraham and Sarah and look at their marriage, I see uh, foolish times, I see where they, they drift away from God, but in spite of all of that, I see commitment. And so there's three things I think we can learn from, from their marriage that can help us. One thing, uh, commitment is strengthened by mutual faith. That's one thing that Abraham and Sarah had. They did have a mutual faith. Both of them believed in God and served God and worshiped God. That is a blessing. I'm telling you. Uh, I don't know what that's like not having that because my wife has been on the same page with me spiritually for all of these years. We've known one another for 40 years and our, our faith is the same. And what a blessing that is, is to have that in, in our, our relationship. It's interesting that in Genesis chapter 11, it says that Abraham and Sarah were from the city of Ur. We know where Ur is. It's in Iraq. And it's south of Babylon, all right, south of Baghdad, that area. And, and it was an ancient city. This, you're looking at ruins that are almost 4,000 years old or about 4,000 years old. The city of Ur. We found it. We know where it's at. You can go and visit it. And as I was doing some of this, uh, uh, I'll actually in the background you'll see that, that big building there. Uh, there's pictures of U.S. soldiers walking up the stairway. And many U.S. soldiers have been to this site because of Desert Storm and what happened in the Middle East. They've, they have visited the city of Ur uh, because of their military resp responsibilities. A as you look at that, you see bricks. You see the bricks? They, brick they had bricks 4,000 years ago. And they said that some of these buildings were two stories high. They've discovered plumbing on the inside of some of these walls. They had running water. The city of Ur was a very sophisticated, a very, some think that it looked something like this during the time of Abraham. So 4,000 years ago, uh, Ur was a very developed place with brick buildings, two-story buildings, plumbing within the building. They, had, uh, they were people known for studying astrology and astronomy. They were a very advanced people. But it's interesting what God said to Abraham. He, here he is in a, a very fortified, very developed place. In Genesis 12, he says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So Abraham and Sarah left a very comfortable life and a very comfortable place to live in tents. From this point on, Abraham and Sarah will not live in a developed city. They will not live behind fortified walls. They will be nomads, and God is saying, I will show you where I want you to go. And so Abraham allows God to become his GPS, and from this point forward, this couple leave a very comfortable life and start living in tents. That would be hard. Some of you are married to somebody who has taken you away from family, right? My wife has. Uh, whenever we, we met in Ohio, got married in Ohio, and it was shortly after that I went to school in Louisiana, and she followed me there. And then we said, okay, let's go to the Caribbean. She followed me there. And I said, how about Connecticut? She followed me here. And so for all of these years, we've been away from family and friends and so forth, and we've been living in other places. Some of you can relate to that. You've, you've, whenever you got married, you were kind of uprooted from what you were used to, and going, you go to another place. Abraham and Sarah were, that, were like that. It's interesting as well that this was also a very idolatrous place. You are looking at a temple to the moon god. It's called the ziggurat, 
or something like that. Z-I-G-G-U-R-A-T. Saddam Hussein had this rebuilt and spent many hours and millions of dollars to, to go and go to these ancient ruins to the moon god, and he had people in Iraq rebuild this place. You can go and see it. And this is where I saw U.S. soldiers. Uh, there's a, uh, a stairway right here, and I saw U.S. soldiers walking up that huge, huge thing. Uh, if you've gone to Mexico City, there's two pyramids outside of Mexico City, one to the sun god, the other one to the moon god. And, and it kind of reminded me of that when I saw this picture. Ur was a, didn't believe in Jehovah. They had all kinds of gods. This was dedicated to Nana. And, and the people of Ur believed that Nana lived well there. And they worshipped the moon god. It's interesting that, that Abraham and Sarah did not. It doesn't tell us how they started believing in Jehovah. But Abraham, Abraham and Sarah did not believe, not believe in the moon god. But they believed in God Almighty. And it does say that Abraham's father also was a polytheist. In, jo in Joshua chapter 24, it says, Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. Abraham's father was not a monotheist. He was a polytheist and probably was involved in worshiping this moon god. But Abraham and Sarah did not. Uh, that they, they worshiped and they had a mutual faith. It is the policy of this congregation that when people are thinking about getting married, we encourage them to marry believers. Amen? It just makes sense that, that you do that. Unfortunately, uh, that's not always the case. And the New Testament even talks about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, uh, Paul talks about where one is a Christian and the other one is not. And some of you can relate to that in this room. We have some right here that one spouse is here, the other spouse is choosing not to be here. In 1 Corinthians 7, it says, To the rest I say this, I not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Apparently, some were thinking, look, I'm a Christian, my spouse is not, maybe I need to end this marriage. Paul is saying, don't do that. Um, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. And then he says in the next verse, for the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. So it's implying that the Christian can have an influence upon the family, even if they have a spouse that's an unbeliever. William Barclay said in a marriage partnership between a believer and a non-believer, the very association may be the means of saving the soul of the unbelieving partner. And so sometimes that can lead that person to Christ. I, I know in my case, uh, we weren't married, but Julie was a Christian and I was not. And her influence helped me come to the church. And, and so that's, that's what happened in our case. The, the Today's Living Bible paraphrased this verse like this. For perhaps the husband who isn't a Christian may become a Christian with the help of his Christian wife. And the wife who isn't a Christian may become a Christian with the help of her Christian husband. Otherwise, if the family separates, the children might never have come to know the Lord, where, whereas a uni united family may, in God's plan, result in the children's salvation. So it's simply saying that if you are in this situation, you are a believer, your spouse is not, you need to live in such a way that would be conducive to trying to bring that person to the Lord. And then Peter will talk about this in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2. He says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your life. So how you talk, how you act, how you handle disagreements should be trying to influence that unbelieving spouse to come to know the Lord. So uh, fortunately, Abraham and Sarah already had that. And it's a blessing 
when you share a, a, a common faith. Another thing I learned from them is that commitment works through challenges. As I look at the Bible, it shows me that Abraham and Sarah were not perfect people. They made many mistakes. For example, in Genesis chapter 12, it talks about Abraham and Sarah. In verse 10, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarah, I know that you are a, what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. She must have been a really good-looking woman, right? So you are to say, my sister, you are my sister, so I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, um, I mean, when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarah was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. Now, if you read the next verse, God's very unhappy. And he sends a plague upon the Egyptians, and the Pharaoh calls Abraham, Abraham in, what, and he says, what, what did you do? And the truth comes out, and they realize that this is his wife, and, Abraham, and, and the Pharaoh tells Abraham, get out of here and take your family with you. This was a mistake. This wasn't Abraham's one of his better moments. It was when his faith faltered. But the thing is, this reminds me that that happens in marriage. I'm not always the man of faith that I need to be. So what? Throw up your hands and quit? I'm glad that the story continues and their faith continues. Uh, God is not happy about this arrangement. Uh, later you'll read in Isaiah, what sorrow waits for those who look to Egypt for help? Instead of looking to the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Abraham should have done that. He should have looked to God and trusted in God, but he came up with his own schemes. Did, was Sarah ever guilty of doing that? Let's read on. In Genesis 16, we, we also see that his wife is going to make a blunder. In Genesis 16, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave girl named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I will build a family through her. That's plan B. All right, God had said, look, I, I'm going to give you guys a child. But then he had them wait, and they're just getting older and older. And Sarah says, hey, I got an idea. Why don't you sleep with my slave girl? Abraham says, good idea. <laughs> you know? And so back then, that wouldn't be so strange. You know, even today, don't we have surrogate motherhood? Right? Back then, they didn't have that, and so they came up with this plan, you know, and within society, it was accepted. And, and so it was acceptable through society. It was acceptable to Sarah, and Abraham said, yeah, I, I'll go along with it, right? You know, sometimes guys can be accused of having a one-track mind. Um, there was an ad in Atlanta newspaper. This is an actual ad that was in Atlanta newspaper. Single black female seeks male companionship. Ethnicity not important. I'm a good looking girl who loves to play. I love long walks in the woods, hunting, camping, fishing trips, cozy winter nights lying by the fire. Candlelight dinners will have me eating out of your hand. Rub me the right, right, right way and watch me respond. I will be at the front door when you come home from work, wearing only what nature gave me. Kiss me, and I am yours. Call 404-875-6420 and ask for Daisy. 15,000 men responded to that. 
And whenever they called 404-875-6420, they got the Atlanta Humane Society. <laughs> and there was a nine-week-old black Labrador retriever named Daisy waiting to be adopted. I noticed some of our single men wrote down that number. <laughs> so. Sometimes men can have a one-track mind. I think Abraham did, all right? Sarah came up with an option, plan B, and he said, yeah, let's go for it. Well, what happened? So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to the husband to be his wife. He slept with her, Hagar, and she conceived. Uh, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abraham, shouldn't have said it, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave girl in your arms and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, and she fled from her. What a mess, right? That they came up with an option, nothing that God suggested. They came up with a plan, independent of God, which was wrong, right? It was wrong. Look at what's happening in the Middle East today because of this decision. Guess where the middle, many of the people from the Middle East get where they trace their ancestry back to? They trace it back to Ishmael. And here you've got this great conflict that's gone on for 4,000 years between Isaac and the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Ishmael to this very day and to this decision. All right? But you know the rest of the story. In Genesis 21, it says, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah. This is 13 years later. As he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised, Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At that very time God had promised him, Abraham gave the, uh, gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah that Sarah bore him. The word Isaac, you know, means laughter, right? And that's what the word actually means. And so uh, God kept his promise. And the, the point is that God worked through their failures. He worked through their mistakes. And another thing I learn about commitment from this couple is that commitment means being faithful unto death. And you see that as well in this text in Genesis 25, verse 10. In the field that Abraham uh, bought from the Hittites, there Abraham was buried with his wife, Sarah. So what do I see? I see that this couple were blessed with a common faith. I see as I read through the text that they didn't always make good choices. That both of them did things that was, that was sinful, that it was wrong, inappropriate. But I see that they hung on to one another and God hang, hung on to them and worked through their imperfection. Someone said, you will not truly know that you've made a commitment until it's difficult for you to keep that commitment. And, you know, it's easy for, for us to be committed when things are fun, right? But it's another thing whenever it becomes a challenge. Abraham and Sarah had ups and downs. They had many challenges in life, but they, they did hang on to one another. And it's interesting that, the, that as you look at Hebrews chapter 11, and it talks about examples of faith, Abraham and Sarah are both mentioned as examples of faith. There's a video clip, clip I want to share with you. It's by Kyle Edelman. Um, Kyle is one of the ministers for a church in Louisville, Kentucky that has 20,000 members. And he put together this little video clip I want to share with you. Hopefully it'll work. In this world, you will have trouble. That's the promise of Jesus from John chapter 16. It's not real comforting, but it's true. In this world and in your marriage, trouble will come. And when trouble comes, it has a way of exposing what a relationship is made of. 
Jesus explained it this way on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, imagine that there are two men, and one builds his house on the rock, the other builds his house on sand, and then a storm comes. When the storm comes, the one who built his house on the sand will find that it's destroyed, but the one who built his house on the rock will find that his house stood firm. And so every marriage, every family, every home will experience a storm. Troubles will come. And when the storm comes, it will expose whether you built your relationship on the sand or on the rock. And Jesus said, if you build your house on the rock, if you build it on me and my words, it will stand firm. Solomon's father, David, put it this way in the Psalms. He said, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. So, uh, today we have Abraham and Sarah making decisions separate from what God wanted them to do. Uh, that they came up with their own devices and, and ended up creating difficulty in their marriage. But at the same time, they were committed to one another and they, they were committed to God. And you see God's faithfulness to this couple in spite of their imperfection. Uh, for every marriage here, you, you and I need to learn to commit. Amen? That we need to learn to commit to one another. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be difficulties. But we need to learn to hold on to one another. And God will hold on to us. And he can bless that. Even with our imperfections. That God can bless a marriage. Like he did Abraham and Sarah. So I, our, our words of, of, of encouragement to you guys is hang on. Don't give up. If things are getting difficult, don't trust on your own devices. Turn to scripture. Turn to God for help. If you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, we always give you a chance to commit to him. The greatest relationship of all. If you haven't done that, you can do that right now. You can meet down front as we sing this song and worship to God. And you can make a commitment to God. Maybe 